Hello wine lovers, Trophy Wine Hunter, welcome back to my wine channel. I'm filming with new camera, a DJ Pro instead of my uh, iPhone. Hopefully this will improve and tell me what you think. I'm going to try and slow down a little bit and take a little bit more care and attention in my videos. So today I'm very excited to bring you a video on my Bordeaux Basics series on the small region of Pomerol. Very interesting region. So we'll start with a number of random facts. Firstly, Pomerol is a region. There is no town of Pomerol. The closest city is Limon, and it's to the south of it. The region is very actually young. It was all, always part of Saint-Emilion, and it only was, got distinct uh, recognition from Saint-Emilion in 1923, and only got AOC status in 1936. It's only about three by kilometers by four kilometers. It's about a seventh of the size of Saint-Yuan, so about 800 hectares. They only produce about 300, in total, all the wineries in Pomerol produce about 350,000 cases a year, which is not a lot. There's only about 150 producers in Pomerol. So it's a really small compact region and that's why I wanted to start with this. It's nice and easy and compact and there's only so many wineries that we can talk about in Pomerol. Pomerol as a region has been producing wines for centuries. 16th and 17th century they were producing wines. However, it was mostly white wines. It only changed in about the 1800s and that's when they started to produce uh, red wines and in the 1936 AOC system, the white wines were outlawed in Pomerol. So it only grew uh, red wine grapes until recently. I think there is one winery that now is producing white wine uh, in the region. If you think about that Pomerol has been producing wines since the 1600s, the elevation of Pomerol as a region has only happened in the last 20 or 30 years, probably since the 1980s. Even when you look back at the 1940s, when they first got classified as an AOC in the 1936, it really wasn't um, done very, or wasn't recognized as a high-end or a high-quality region. There's a number of reasons for, for that. But even in 1943, when there had some comparative, the, um, there was a kind of a commission uh, list of wineries, a price list, and there was only a couple of wineries that made that list at that time. They were uh, Petrus, of course, La Consignant, uh, Ver uh, Chateau Sauterne, VCC. So those, in my mind, are really incredible wineries because at that point they weren't producing wines that were of the quality that we know of Pomerol today. Why is that? It's because for most of the 20th century, winemaking in Pomerol was influenced very heavily by a person called uh, Emile Pounod. And he was a very famous, uh, I guess, oenologist who had studied grapes. But unfortunately, his studies had to do with the left bank and with Cabernet Sauvignon. They didn't know any better, but they were applying techniques to Cabernet Sauvignon grape, the growth of grapes, to Merlot and Cabernet Franc. So, of course, they weren't getting the most out of this. And therefore, I guess my thinking, my thought process, if Petrus and Le Consignant and uh, VCC were producing such high quality wines, and they were using the wrong technique. These must be like great wineries. So that, we'll go through the history, but that was one of the reasons that in general, those wines were kind of looked, overlooked. So that was one of the reasons. The second reason is Robert Parker. And Parker, for all you don't like or like don't like him, I think a lot of regions in Bordeaux and particularly uh, regions like Pomerol and uh, wines that Lapin that I have here are heavily indebted to him because without his influence there would have been no focus on this region 
it was kind of a novel region in 1980s and he discovered it maybe for his own self-interest a little bit but nevertheless without his influence and his spotlight on the region i'm not sure that they would have uh, commanded those prices in that time now you can argue that the the wines are so good that eventually someone would discover them but i think uh, we have to give some credit to robert parker he give he sometimes takes some uh, slack a lot of slack but he's also done some great things for wineries and in particular certain regions in uh, france what emile punod's winemaking techniques did was essentially make merlot wines kind of tannic and hard and that's not what the basis of merlot is or neither is it cabernet franc and so for many years these wines were seen as very austere which is unbelievable merlot being austere but that's what happened but techniques such as allowing the fruit to hang on the vines a little bit longer in the right bank helped soften and uh, all other techniques i'm not a winemaker but there were other innovations and techniques that were suited particularly to the Merlot grape that improved the quality of wine tremendously. I'm going to talk about two other individuals that had a huge effect on this region. One is Jean-Pierre Meix, who purchased Trottenoy in uh, 1953. He also purchased Le, um, Le Fleur Petrus, and he, in 1959, um, purchased Chateau Lagrange, which I am going to review shortly after this video. He also, and, and with that, he brought a lot of winemaking knowledge, money, and focus to this region. And uh, subsequently to that, he's purchased, their family has purchased other wineries like Chateau Lagrave, La Tour Pomerol, and uh, Hosanna. So that really has in my mind, these are wines that you should probably keep in mind because Jean-Pierre Moix has a lot of knowledge and has a lot of history in this region. So you could call him a Pomerol expert. So that's one person that I would really look out for. If you see him consulting with wines in the Pomerol region, I would say that's a very good sign. I also forgot to mention that Jean-Pierre Moix, very importantly, also purchased the majority interest in Chateau Petrus in 1964. So he's got a lot of great wineries. And again, his name is synonymous with quality wineries in Pomerol. The other name that you should know with the Pomerol region is Michel Roland. And so he was born in the Pomerol region and he had the, his family at the, the state Le Bon Passieux. And he came about his prominence came about at the same time as Robert Parker in the 1980s and 1990s. And this was perfect because his style of winemaking was very in tune with what Robert Parker's taste buds preference was. And so this was perfect. And then it was just the right time when there was um, some interest in starting to have in wine and uh, higher end knowledge and Robert Parker was just the right person for that time. So everything came together perfectly for the Pomerol region and in particular certain wines like Le Pin, like Petrus and some of Michel and Roland's wines. So Michel and Roland's style is that he actually thought that, you know, we should kind of hang the grapes much longer on the vine and that would give uh, overripeness to the grapes, much more power, a lot more alcohol, very much not the traditional Bordelais style, which is much softer, lighter, lower alcohol content. And this was um, in contrast to the Muex style, which wanted a lot of vibrancy, a lot of acidity, freshness. You'll see, you still see that in um, Christian Moex's wines, like this is a characteristic, a lot of vibrancy. And so Christian Moex is associated with more classical uh, French Bordelais style. And Michel Roland is more uh, associated with Parkerized wines. So a um, new level or new world thinking of Bordeaux wines. And it just came about in the right time he just had it at the right 
uh, he hit the market at the right time with Robert Parker. And these things just, it's kind of chance and coincidence. And it's funny how this thing works. Um, everyone just came in at the same time. Had it been 10 years later or 10 years earlier, maybe it would have not been the same people. I think eventually people would have appreciated the Pomoro region, but uh, it just came together. And that's why in the 80, 1982 vintage, really for a lot of the wineries like Le Pin, like Chateau Petrus, really dominated and really became um, important years All throughout the 80s and 90s. That's where they really became very prominent. So if you look at it in that manner, Pomeroy wines, even though they're very, very expensive, very well known at this point, really have a very a short history compared to other wineries of prominence. And even the region itself has a very short history. If you're talking about 60 years in wine terms, it's a very, very short time period. Let's talk a little bit on a fairly cursory level about the region, its influences and how that influences the wine. So it's not really close to the sea. It is kind of continental in climate, mild. It's got um, a diurnal temperature, so it's got um, a, quite a big variation from the daytime to the nighttime. And it experiences one of the threats that you have for Merlot grapes. You don't want it too hot. So hot vintages like 2003, 2009, although are great vintages, may not be great for the right bank. And in fact, they do much better in um, milder vintages, cooler vintages. Um, that's why the 2006 and 2008 years were quite good. I just bought the 2011. Um, it was albeit Chauvel Blanc, but generally speaking, you don't have to have the very hot vintages for right bank wines. And there are very, very few vintages there are where both the right and left bank make spectacular wines. In general, if it's a very hot, hot year, the left bank is going to make better wines. If it's going to be a cooler year, more uh, moderate year, the right bank is going to make better wines. Couple of things that you worry about in the right bank and particularly with the Merlot grape, you worry about rain, too much rain, because it's particularly with the clay soils, they don't um, do very well with drainage. And then likewise, you worry about spring frosts. Those are really the two things that really you have to look out for in the right bank area. Let's talk a little bit about the topography of Pomerol region. It's generally pretty flat. They have some sloping, um, but pretty flat. And there is one part of it, which is called the Pomerol Plateau little bit higher and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In general, the best wineries in Pomerol sit very close to the saint Emilion border near Chateau Blanc. And a good rule of thumb is if you can see, if that winery can see Chateau Chateau Blanc from their winery, it's probably in a pretty good location. The Pomerol Plateau, a lot is made of it because of blue clay. So blue clay is synonymous with the Pomerol region. There's, I think, the most deposits of blue clay in Pomerol. And which winery has the most blue clay? Uh, it's Chateau Petrus. That's not the end, on a, an end all and be all of um, Merlot, but there are other wineries in Pomerol that make great wines that are not on the plateau, that don't have a, a proportion of uh, a large proportion of blue clay, but it's always nice to have some blue clay, and I'll explain that a little bit later. And I always thought when I bought this wine, Chateau La Grange, that any wine on the Pomerol Plateau has got to be great because it's all blue clay. Well, it's not quite true. So that's to an oversimplification. But again, blue clay isn't the end all and be all everything. So why is blue clay important for the growth of Merlot grapes? So it's because of the soil type and kind of to put it simply, blue clay is very hard and it's kind of um, very difficult to, uh, to, for vines to get through, so they have to work very hard. And secondly, it, because it's so hard, it kind of acts like a, a, a very hard sponge. So it can extract in bad years where there's not a lot of rain, it actually does very well because that clay absorbs up the, the moisture and can um, 
portion it out over many months. So the best years, I think, for Pomerol would be, especially for Chateau Petrus, would be um, very drought-like conditions, but mild weather. Not a lot of rain. They actually do very well because rain doesn't affect them as much as other people. Like drought doesn't affect them as other, as other people. Wet years actually are very bad because, again, the opposite effect happens, that the blue clay treats the water like sponges and then they have so much water and then they retain so much water that it's not good. It kind of drowns the, the, the grapes so, or the vines. So those are generally not as good a year for um, wineries that have blue clay. Which wineries sit on the blue clay? Again, Chateau Petrus, most of Chateau Petrus sits on this blue clay. And that is seen as one of the best soils to grow Merlot grapes in. There's also uh, La Consaillant, which sits on there. Evangile, La Fleur, Gazan, Trottenoy, Clinet, Le Gay, uh, Alt Ferrand, and VCC. So these are some of the top wineries. But again, you're missing some in here, um, like La Pin. Um, is not on that list, but that doesn't mean it's not a great winery because that has other soils that um, are also can grow very well with um, Grow Merlot very well because blue clay is such a big thing Some people believe there's a second buttonhole um, Near the first one that's just off the plateau and wineries that are on that type of soil is the Clisi Clinet Trottenoy, uh, Clos La Glaise, La Cabane, and Chateau Nenin. So it's hard to say. Does, I don't know if that makes that much of a difference, but people like to talk about blue clay. Historically, red wine grapes were not grown in Pomerol all the way up until the 1800s. It wasn't popular. And even at that point, Merlot was not the dominant grape until very recently. So I think there was... Um, mostly grown in this region was a grape called Boucher, which is Cabernet Franc, which they're still grown today. There was a huge frost in 1956, which basically um, killed all the vines. And as I was, when I was touring Pomerol, they explained to me that the government kind of gave incentive money for people to replant Merlot grapes instead of this Boucher, which was difficult to grow and was apt to frost. Uh, so I think Merlot was a little bit less resistant to, uh, more resistant to frost. So the government kind of gave them incentives to grow Merlot. And subsequently, that's why there's so much Merlot in this Pomerol region. About 80% of the vineyards are grown with Merlot. The rest, most of it is Cabernet Franc. I think there's a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon and I think there's a little bit of uh, Petit Verdot, I think very small portions. But the key thing is that there were some wineries who refused to give up on the Boucher grape uh, or the Cabernet Franc clone. And those are among some of the best wineries in the right bank region. I'm just talking about Pomerol, but also Saint-Emilion. And this would include Cheval Blanc, Auxon, um, I think Petrus, La Fleur. Some of those kept the old stock and did not replant Merlot. And so they have the original strains that are pre-1956 frost, which are actually called Boucher. And what I was told when I was in Pomerol was that the difference between the old strain was that this old strain, once it survived the frost, is very resistant to any type of uh, weather conditions because it's if it had survived that frost which almost killed everything it's a very resistant vine so those grapes have a great hardiness it's almost when you have like immunity when you have um, uh, um, a cold they they kind of has this immunity now to frost and so even when there's um, spring frost these grapes don't have any issues with the old what they call boucher grapes that's what i was told um, and they do produ produce a, spit, um, a certain type of vigor and a certain type of taste that adds to the complexity of the wine. Um, so that's one of the reasons I was given that some of these wineries are so spectacular. It's not that they just drove Cabernet Franc, which other wineries have, but they have an older strain of Cabernet Franc 
that's called Boucher. I'm doing this video backwards because I'm the reason for doing this video is because I'm doing a review of the pin and that will come up shortly and then thereafter I drank some Lagrange and I thought you know when I'm drinking all these wines I should probably know a little bit more give a little bit more information about Pomerol which is kind of a very interesting region and I haven't done anything in my Bordeaux basic series for quite a while so I thought I'd go back to this but it's just a nice and neat region to do because it's so small I like it very much the producers again are really not that many um, there are a lot of smaller producers that are not really well known outside of France because they're so small um, but of the larger ones and none of them are really that large there, there's really only a handful and so that's the nice thing you don't have hundreds and hundreds of wineries that you have to know so it's a really interesting region and again Merlot based with a little bit of Cabernet Franc really um, exotic and very much um, soft in a, in a very nice way and for those people who um, haven't experienced the pleasure of Merlot or haven't got the Merlot bug this is where you need to go for Merlot because the way it's produced in Pomerol and Saint Emilion is um, very effective in terms of bringing out the best characteristics of Merlot and that was the problem again in the 19 um, before the 1980s that they were trying to make Merlot in the Cabernet style so you're kind of asking some of uh, the, the grape to be something it's not and now that it's got the right people and the right modern technology that we can tell what is it should be done with the grape it's really producing what it should and it's distinguishing itself from uh, Cabernet Sauvignon quite a bit so for those people that say well I can't tell the difference between left bank and right bank please drink some of these um, wines on the right bank and maybe put them a little bit of age uh, I think you'll find a pretty distinct difference between left bank and right, wine, right bank wines, particularly at the higher end and particularly if you can give them some age, 10 or 15 years. Very hard again to distinguish wines when they're young. I hope this um, video has been useful and informative and I hope that you look forward to my upcoming tastings of Le Pin and uh, Chateau Lagrange. Until next time, happy drinking.